So, chapter 426 of MHA is officially out, and the epilogue is epilogging. And boy oh boy, if there was ever a storyline in MHA that needed wrapping up, it was the Todoroki family's drama. Because this family makes my family look healthy, and we very purposely live on three corners of the country. And thus, in a chapter very, very different from 425, which seemed to set up the epilogue, chapter 426 seemed to shut it down. See, well, chapter 425 seemed to introduce character arcs and possible villains that could build out the story into a longer story. Chapter 426 seems to be at least the beginning of the closing of the Todoroki timeline, with the entirety of the Todoroki family coming together to talk to Toya or Dobby possibly one last time. And as the Todoroki family drama, more importantly the Endeavor drama, is one of the most hotly debated topics in the entirety of the MHA fandom, I found this chapter to be incredibly compelling. One, because I believe what happened in this chapter will be incredibly divisive, and two, because I genuinely believe it was tackled in one of the best ways it could have been. But does that mean we're all aboard the Forgive Endeavor train? No, not really. But then again, neither is his family. And that's what's so genuinely compelling about the conclusion or possible conclusion of the Todoroki timeline story. But the Todoroki timeline is in all that gets wrapped up in this chapter. As in this chapter, we also got check-ins with Hawks, Lady Nagant, Gentle, and La Brava, and even Spinner. Yes, this chapter, much more than chapter 425, seemed as though, for the first time yet, that MHA might just be ending. And when you consider the fact that Horikoshi has already came out and said that MHA is ending August 5th, which means that there is now only four chapters left, that makes a fair amount of sense. And thus, even though new villains weren't introduced in this chapter and we never got the check-in with Class 2A, a lot happened in this chapter that I genuinely believe is worth conversing about. Because if there's one thing I know about and love talking about, its dysfunctional families. So with no further ado, let's get into chapter 426 of MHA Explained. But before we get to explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you love the idea of me keeping you up to date on all things anime and manga, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Sitaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So chapter 426 picks up where chapter 425 left off three weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Am I projecting JJK? Maybe two weeks ago. With Endeavor and Shoto standing in front of, uh, I guess, what formerly used to be Dobby. However, Endeavor and Shoto aren't alone. In fact, their entire family is standing in front of Dobby together. That means Shoto's other brother and sister, Natsuo and Fuyumi, and Shoto's mom slash Endeavor's ex-wife? Do we ever talk about whether or not they got divorced? Rei, who recently got out of the insane asylum just to get scorched by her son. And I guess that's kind of the risk you run when you're an ice user in a house full of fire users. But then again, they didn't particularly stop Shoto from being burned, so here we are. The chapter opens with Fiumi telling Rei that they told her she didn't need to come. As in, she didn't need to come to Dobby slash Toya's, uh, it seems at this point, like a seance. However, Rei retorts back and says, Fiumi and Natsuo, I could say the same for you. You don't have to be here. At which point, Endeavor chips in and says, well, yeah, you didn't need to come either, Rei. And it's at this point that you realize that the Todoroki family has not spent much time with each other and therefore they're not all super stoked to see each other. They're basically going through a long line of pointing at each other and saying, you don't need to be here when all of them are just as equally related to Dobby as each other. And Shoto, not to be left out of the conversation, even though he is the only one in the family to walk away from the battle against Dobby without shortened hair or more scars. When I guess when you consider the fact that Shoto was the only person with facial scars prior to this battle, I guess it's just evening the playing field. And thus Shoto tells his entire family that it's not some sense of duty that brought me here today, and I think that applies to all of you. And I think at this moment, Shoto somehow, as the youngest person in the family, is the only one being even remotely rational. See, because all the other family members pointing at each other and saying, you don't have to be here, ignores the reason of why they would go in the first place. It's not about having to be there. It's about wanting to be there. Nobody in this family has any obligation to even try to like the other people in this family, considering everything they put each other through. And yet all of these people who are equally scarred by the likes of Toya and Endeavor are still choosing to come together to try to talk to Toya. And at this point, the Toya's guard or doctor tells them he's only talking for a few minutes a day. And it's at this point that we see Toya, who is for lack of a better word, a charred skeleton. It kind of looks like Irigamagori in a shackle regalia from Kill La Kill. Or like, 
Mechamaru. He doesn't look good, and apparently he's not doing good either, as the doctor slash guard informs the Todoroki family that he's slowly but surely heading towards his death. However, that's kind of in the state of Toya for the entirety of the MHA manga. As we know, ever since Toya awoke from his years-long coma after burning down an entire mountain, that he was essentially supposed to die. However, the amount of hate and vitriol that Toya held in his heart for his family kept him alive, which is probably what's keeping him alive right now. But considering the fact he looks like a frozen pizza you drunkenly put in the oven at 2 a.m. and then forgot to take out until 10 a.m., that's very impressive. Now, to this point, that Toya, through his gumless and lipless mouth, looks down upon his Todoroki family and says, ah, you're coming out of the woodwork. It's like I'm a tourist spot or something. And kind of like me trying to make a bad punchline, he immediately pays for it with a coughing fit. Now, Ray is immediately concerned for Toya, but Endeavor takes this opportunity to start talking or monologuing. And Endeavor says, I've come to talk about what's to come, Toya. I'm retiring as a hero. Now, to this point, that Endeavor tells us that even before the war had started, this was his plan, after the war, to retire as a hero. But now, considering the fact that he can't walk on his own and he lost his right arm... The choice has kind of been made for him. Now, while I understand what Horikoshi is trying to do here, I can't help but feel like Endeavor no longer being able to continue as a hero kind of cheapens this. See, of course, Endeavor can sit here and say, oh, I was planning on retiring after the war anyways because of how I treated my family and how decidedly unhero like that was. Now that he really no longer has the option about whether or not he can be a hero in the first place, him retiring as a hero as penance to Toya and the rest of his family just doesn't mean as much. And ironically, this kind of coincides with how Endeavor has been going about his apology tour since the jump. See, while Endeavor has made a rather concerted effort to try to apologize to Shoto and the rest of his family in terms of physically apologizing to them with his words, that would be verbally apologizing, not physically, I'm dumb. The other key way that Endeavor has gone about his apology tour is by being a hero. Basically, Endeavor's entire ideology was say sorry to your family, try and be around as a father, and also continue being a big, bright, shining star. And while you can buy into the ideology that Endeavor, trying to do inherently heroic stuff, does technically make him a better person and is a good way to apologize, you need to realize he, he was gonna do that anyways. Endeavor was always gonna be a hero, whether or not it was tied to him trying to make it up to his family or not. And thus, if in the peak of his powers, Endeavor had stepped down from being a hero because of how he acted, that would have meant something. But now that the biggest villain on Earth has been defeated and he can no longer act as a hero, retiring at this point in the story accomplishes a grand total of nothing. And thus, once again, all Endeavor can really do to apologize to his family is say sorry, which I'm sorry just isn't enough. But I will admit that this chapter does have for moments from Endeavor where he does go above and beyond saying sorry. The Endeavor continues on by saying, the hero Endeavor burned to death. Your flames were truly stronger than mine. He says to the burnt chicken nugget. Now, to this point, that Dobby, who looks more like Kaiju number nine than a Todoroki, says, oh, really? My condolences. He continues on by saying, don't go saying all of this after everything is over, you coward. Because all Toya ever wanted to hear is that he was good enough from Endeavor. And in this moment, now that Endeavor knows that Toya is dying and Endeavor is a large reason he's there, Endeavor is finally telling Toya that he's good enough. Now to this point that Endeavor responds by saying, you're right. You know everything about me, Toya. After all, you were always watching me and you wanted me to do the same for you. But. I didn't. Now, to this point, that we get a flashback to Toy's childhood when he was talking to Endeavor about how much he idolized him. Because, like I've already said, all Toya or Dobby ever wanted was acknowledgement from their father, something they never got. And while you could make the argument that Endeavor didn't want Toya to use his flames because he knew it would hurt him, if Endeavor wasn't so hellbent on trying to reproduce the perfect air and actually took time with Toya to help him control his fire at a heat that wouldn't scorch off his skin, not only could he have had an incredibly powerful fire type user, but also he wouldn't have driven his son into insanity. Endeavor then continues by saying, no matter what anyone says, your heat doesn't come from my hell flame. He then continues by saying, I've been watching your indictment video every single day. Now, I believe what Endeavor is saying here is that Endeavor has been watching the video that Dobby made talking about how Endeavor is his father and how Dobby's killed 30 plus people every single day. Now, I can't imagine a real reason that Endeavor would do this other than like needlessly and privately punishing himself because while sure, the indictment video does talk about Toya's upbringing and how Endeavor abused him and how that abuse led to his eventual mental break, which led to him killing people and how that blood is on Endeavor's hands. And like, I guess technically I could see Endeavor watching this video over and over 
over and over again would allow him to assume blame for what he did to Toya and therefore to the people that Toya killed. But like those who have grievances with Endeavor are the people who should be hearing from him every single day. And fortunately, that's exactly where the conversation between Toya and Endeavor goes. As Endeavor tells Toya that from now on, I'm going to come every single day. So let's talk. Now, I like this a lot. And I especially like how Horikoshi frames this conversation with Toya and Endeavor standing across from each other. Well, I guess Endeavor sitting, but they're both in the forms that they were prior to their legendary battle against each other in the war, but they are still both missing their right arms. And this, for the first time in Endeavor's storied career of trying to apologize, is something that I can get behind. See, Endeavor is understanding that Toya being alive is not a curse, but a blessing. A blessing that will allow him to every day come and speak with his son like he should have done oh so long ago. And Endeavor even acknowledges this. But to this point that the doctor steps in and says that Toya's heart rate is going too high and therefore they'll have to leave. As after all, currently Toya is basically just sentient teeth. However, Endeavor doesn't heed this warning and tells the rest of his family, those being Rei, Natsuo, and Fuyumi, let's make good use of this extra time we have with Toya. Let's talk to him like we've never had the opportunity to previously. Endeavor continues by saying, you're free to hate me. You're free to do whatever you want. Throw it all at me. And at this moment, Fuyui chimps in and says, at me as well. Ray then chips in and says, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. And we see that this onslaught of love from the Todoroki family is having its effect on Toya, as his heart rate increases and increases to the point where eventually the doctor needs to step in and tell the Todoroki family to leave. We can continue this conversation tomorrow anymore more and he might die however it's at this point that shoto steps forward and says can i ask one last thing there's something that i want to know toya ni which means my brother toya what's your favorite food now this is an obvious reference to shoto's response to finding out that toya is his long lost older brother see as some of you who are currently watching the new season of mha might know a point of conversation that just recently came up in the anime was shoto wondering about what his older brother's favorite food was and i believe he's having this conversation with ida who says he probably likes cold soba and in response to this todoroki muses okay well, one day, me and him will have cold soba together. Now, Shoto doesn't get a response from Toya, and thus the family has to turn away, with the doctor telling them that Toya's body has reached his limit for today, and that he should sleep, and they'll come back later. But as the Todoroki family is heading out the door, from the now-cooled convection oven, the chicken nugget said, Soba. To which Shoto turns around and says, same here. Now, this response from Shoto triggers a flashback to Shoto and Toya's battle. To where Dobby screamed at Shoto, running in parallel, but forever apart. To which Shoto responded with, no, we're gonna mingle, whether you like it or not. We then, in the last panel of this page, see that Toya is crying. A response that wasn't elicited from anybody else from the Todoroki family. And I believe there's a reason for that. See, while we can obviously all sit here and say that Toya is a victim of Endeavor's abuse, and therefore the mental break that Toya underwent was almost entirely Endeavor's fault, I think what Toya is realizing in this moment is that as a child, when he was still a part of the Todoroki family, he was so singularly interested in getting appraisal from his father that he never took a moment to reach out to the people around him. And the reason I believe that is because of what Endeavor says earlier in this conversation, where Endeavor says, you know everything about me. You never took your eyes off me. And that's true. Toya does know everything about Endeavor because he was so singularly obsessed with Endeavor as an entity and a father figure and a hero. But because of this in the brief moments that we've seen from Toya's past when he was still a part of the Todoroki family, even though for the majority of Toya's life he had his younger sister and his younger brother, he never seemed particularly interested in them. He never asked about their struggles, their hobbies, their favorite foods. All he wanted was approval from his father. And while we can't fault a child for wanting that, I believe what Toya is realizing at this moment is that Shoto is one of the first people to ask him about him, which is not only an incredible moment for Toya, but also a moment that made him realize that he never asked his family about themselves. And thus, in the same way that he constantly had his eyes on Endeavor, Shoto had his eyes on Toya. And much in the same way that Toya was desperate for Endeavor to know things about him and to appreciate him, Toya is now realizing that Shoto felt the same way about him, which elicits the response of Toya crying and saying, Shoto, sorry. See, because what Toya didn't realize is that he was perpetuating the same cycle that Endeavor created, a cycle of abuse propagated through singular focus. And we then cut to the Todoroki family that's made its way outside of the medical facility. And at this point, the Natsuo turns around to Endeavor and says, 
that's it for me. Sorry, but I won't change my mind. I'll never be seeing you again. To which Endeavor really has no choice but to accept. And I'm actually very happy that he did accept Natsuo's rejection because not everybody deserves redemption. See, whether or not somebody deserves redemption is up to the person who was harmed. And thus Natsuo, even seeing Endeavor trying his hardest to redeem himself in the eyes of his family, has every single right to reject that attempt. Natsuo then says, I want to start a family with my girlfriend. There'll be no ceremony and you'll never meet her. To which Endeavor says, that's okay. I'm sorry. Natsuo then turns to Fuyumi and says, what about you, sis? You quit your job, right? To which she responds by saying, I did, but one of my students' mothers introduced me to a new workplace and they're being very supportive of me. Natsuo then shifts the conversation back to Endeavor, saying, to be honest, I think you fulfilled your responsibility and you've been punished already. Can't you just stop? To which Endeavor says, I will continue to apologize and give reparations for my crimes for the rest of my life. And once again, I believe this is the appropriate response from Endeavor. As it currently stands, he can't step down from being a hero any more than he already has and while I've already said that I believe the hero card being taken away from him just in time for him to step down definitely takes some of the severity out of it outside of Endeavor literally going to jail all he can do is be remorseful now would I complain about the idea of Endeavor going to jail no not necessarily but it would limit his ability to make amends with his family and it would put the onus of making those amends on his family because they would have to go visit him. Endeavor then continues on and says, but you don't have to watch me make these amends. I'll do everything to make sure I'm the only one to blame for everything that happened. If there's a reason I survived the battle against Toya, then this is it. Natsuo then responds by saying, it'll be hell on earth. To which Endeavor responds by saying, I know, but I've accepted the invite to the dance already. Natsuo then responds to this finally by saying, this is the first time I've ever thought you were cool. And that's the thing. I genuinely believe one of the most compelling dynamics in the entirety of MHA is Endeavor and Natsuo's relationship. See, while some people will say that Toya is the lost son, that's not true. Natsuo, worse than anybody, had to see firsthand what Endeavor was. Natsuo was old enough to understand the loss of Toya, but Natsuo didn't go into a coma for three years. Natsuo had to be in the house every single day Endeavor beat Shoto down to make him the perfect son. Natsuo had to deal with the trauma of what happened to his mother mother, what happened to Shoto, and what happened to Toya, all while being old enough to understand all of it. And as he was incredibly close to Toya and an older brother to Shoto, he, more than anybody, should be upset with Endeavor. And this is why I believe Horikoshi did such an incredible job writing out their relationship. Because if there's one person on Earth who shouldn't accept Endeavor's apology, it should be Natsuo. Because not only was Natsuo privy to all of the abuse going on in the house, but he also never got any of the attention that Toya was so desperate for. Well, plenty of people might make the argument that Shoto had it worse than Natsuo. Trust me, when I say, when you grow up with an abusive father, being the favorite goes a long way. And not until you're much older do you realize that being the favorite never meant anything outside of the fact that you got the occasional smile. And ironically, that's very well orchestrated by the fact that Shoto was much quicker to forgive Endeavor than Natsuo. But speaking of Natsuo, Natsuo turns to Shoto and says, well, what about you, Shoto? You're going back to school, right? To which Shoto responds by saying yes. Natsuo then tells Shoto that'll give him and his sister a ride. And as Shoto is loading into Natsuo's car, he sticks his head out the window and says, old man, Mom, I have my class by my side, and I'm on a path to be the person I want to be. So, I'll be fine. Ray then wheels Endeavor over to a car stuffed to the brim with his sidekicks and shows him her phone, which has messages from Hawks, and tells him some people are keeping a keen eye on us. The text from Hawks say, how was the conversation? If anything's bothering you, just talk to me, which is objectively kind of cute. The four of a number one and number two heroes chatting it out like best buds. And it's at this point that we cut to Hawks, who, mind you, and I feel as though I need to remind a fair amount of you, is currently quirkless, and is gonna be quirkless forever, because All For One stole his quirk. And when All For One, the baby version of All For One, died, everybody who had their quirk stolen lost those quirks forever. And at that point, a lot of people thought Hawks was gonna die because he was kind of like fading away, but that was just his quirk fading away. So Hawks is still alive, but he lost his quirk. So now Hawks, like Endeavor, is forced into a non-hero life. Back to Hawks, who's talking to Lady Nagant, who is also still alive. And Hawks is saying, what, you're not leaving, even though I said it's fine? Now, obviously, what Hawks is referencing here is the fact that Lady Nagant worked for All For One for a while as an assassin who tried to kill Deku. You're remembering all this? But then when she eventually switches sides to the good guys, All For One blows her up, which is why everybody thought she was dead, but she's not. 
she's alive. And Lady Nagant responds to Hawks by saying, I don't want to go outside yet. The world's scary and I might get used again. So she's not quirkless. If she's afraid that she's going to get used again, that still means she can make her hair into bullets and fire them. Now Hawk responds to this news by saying, but I wanted your help with so many things, which kind of sounds like he wanted to use her. So maybe she's right to stay in prison. Now Lady Nagant responds by saying, what we have to do now is wait and see how the world reacts to what Izuka Midori accomplished and see how their reaction to this accomplishment changes the outside world. Lady Nagant then says, the taxes will be paying for my meals for at least a little while longer, to which Hawks responds, you damn villain. I'm, listen, I hate to be that MHA fan, but there's chemistry here. Oh my god, Lady Nagant's in her late 30s? That is news to me. You know what? Hawk seems like the kind of guy to go for older women, so do it. I don't care. God, I knew I loved MILFs. But speaking of love being in the air, the next page shows La Brava and Gentle Criminal being reunited. Or as their effort during the war has been acknowledged, thus they've done enough to be deemed worthy of being set free. And it's a very weepy, very cute reunion where the both of them are telling each other how incredible they were during the war. And the forever really weird looking couple is back together. I don't know why we have to make LaBrava so small. I get it. She's 22. He's 32. But like, it's just, and then he looks older than 32. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. It's, cu it's cute. I'm happy they're back together. It's just, I didn't, I wish they didn't look like that. Now, at this point, we cut back to Hawks, who's reading his very dad-like messages from Endeavor that say, thank you. We're fine. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. We'll let you know if we need anything. And then a whole other message to say, it's okay. Now this gets Hawks thinking they're so tough, which makes a lot of sense because Endeavor did lose his ability to walk his arm and a fair amount of his skin. And he's still taking time out of his day to go visit his, well, I guess, substantially more injured son. Endeavor then six tuple, sex, sex tuple texts. If it's, if it's six, it, it would be a sex tuple text, right? I think that's what it is to say, you must be going through a lot too, being the new president of the HPSC. Still so young, but determined to make a change. Now, for those of you who don't know what the HPSC is, that's the Hero Public Safety Commission, aka the governmental body and MHA responsible for mediating the relationship between heroes and society as a whole. And thus, they're kind of like the FBI for heroes. They provide the provisional hero license exams, work closely with the police force to coordinate hero teams, handling individual heroes to solve dangerous missions like they did with Hawks when they commanded him to become a double agent and infiltrate the League of Villains, and so much more. Like grooming Lady Nagant to turn into assassins so that they could use her as a gun to point at any corrupt heroes and villains. They are a very, very complicated organization of questionable morals. And the reason the HPSC was without a president is because during the Paranormal Liberation War, the HPSC invited Redestro to their headquarters with hopes of arresting him. However, it wasn't Redestro, it was a twice double. And thus this twice double managed to retaliate against the HPSC and destroy the headquarters and kill their current president. And thus Hawks stepped up after the war, now being quirkless, to be the new president of the HBSC. Now Hawks doesn't respond to any of the texts that Endeavor sends, which is kind of rude considering the fact he sends six, but instead decides to immediately call up Mara. But Nick, who's Mara? Well, that would be Yokomi Romero. Nick, who's Yokomi Romero? He works for the HPSC. He's a background character's background character. He was the acting president of the HPSC after the president's death. He's the person holding the dead president after Redestro attacks HQ. Now, apparently he didn't act as standing president of the HPSC too long because obviously the president is now Hawks, but he does still work for the HPSC and specifically Hawks. And Hawks is presumably calling him because Mara is stationed at Spinner's hospital bed. As with the last panel of chapter 426, we see Spinner laying in a hospital hospital bed and we hear a kerchuk as in the sound of a real telephone being hung up you know like a kerching you guys remember landlines right of course you do you're all totally my age i don't even know why i'm acting like landlines were around for that much of my life they were basically irrelevant by the time i was 14 but anyways none of this is really important all that's really important is that spinner is still alive and ironically that's probably because of all for one's death see for those of you who forget that mha solved racism in like six chapters let me quickly run you up on what happened with spinner around chapter 370 ish i believe see in the beginning part of the war, the idea that heteromorphs were discriminated against was introduced, and thus Spinner was made a social justice leader of sorts by the heteromorphs, who felt as though they had to rally against the humans who had suppressed them for so long. However, in order to make sure that Spinner was strong enough to get this point home, and strong enough to free ooh, Portal Man. Like, all important characters in MHA, he has two names, and I'm googling them. I don't need to google it, it came back to me, Core Gary. Oh, Nick, I thought you were supposed to know everything. There's so many names in this manga, and he's 
he's dead, so who cares? Anyways, in order to make sure that Spinner was strong enough to get back core Geary, All For One gave him two additional quirks. However, since it's been very well established by the MHA manga that a body shouldn't have more than one quirk outside of All For One and One For All, because of the mental load of that many quirks on your brain, Spinner, with all of these quirks, basically had the intelligence of a four-year-old. And thus, Spinner was being manipulated by the other heteromorphs operating under All For One. And yet, part of Spinner's personality still shone through as he tried to get to Korrigiri so Korrigiri could help Shigaraki in his dream of destruction. However, right before Spinner was able to get to Korrigiri, present Mike hit him with a point blank. Yeah! I don't uh, scream? I don't know what his move is called. And it hit Spinner so hard it literally punched the other quirks off him. Now, unfortunately for Spinner, he had already been beaten up by everybody from Anna Voice to Duple Arms to Present Mike. And therefore, by the time he finally gets the Korrigiri, his body's not in the best shape. And thus, it was somewhat assumed, even though Spinner was able to place one of Shigaraki's hands on Korrigiri's face and awake him, that Spinner was going to die. However, possibly because of All for One's death and the fact that when All for One died, all the people he stole quirks from and all the people he gave quirks to were freed from those shackles, this could have allowed for Spinner to bounce back. Which seems to be the case because the Spinner we see in the hospital bed looks like the Spinner of old, not the new multi-quarked Spinner. Now I find Spinner still being alive rather interesting because I believe it could set a precedent that we'll see in the next couple of chapters, that every villain that didn't explicitly die is still around. I mean, look at Dobby. If anybody should be dead, it's him. On top of that, Spinner's still alive, which makes me believe that other people, possibly like Toga, might still be kicking it. Now this raises the question, is Stain still alive? So while my answer previous to this chapter would have been no, he got literally juiced by All For One. Honestly, after seeing that Dobby was able to survive Jogo's domain expansion, it's hard for me to say that Stain has kicked the bucket. So I believe in the next couple of chapters, we'll see all the villains who acknowledge their wrongdoings at the end possibly still be alive. But at the same time, Stain killed 40 heroes. If he's dead, that's not the worst thing. But overall, this was a great chapter and very in line with what an epilogue should look like. But considering the fact that we only have four chapters left and the last chapter was introducing new characters and new storylines makes me slightly concerned. Because four chapters is not a whole lot of time to wrap up this entire story while also possibly trying to do more with it. But I'm curious to hear from you guys. What'd you think about this chapter? Did you enjoy it? Do you think the epilogue's heading in the right direction? Do you forgive Endeavor? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Thane's like, oh yeah, no, I, the, I used my own blood to stop my back from breaking over the corner of this industrial window I was bent out on.